Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Been gone for a while. Um, if you're new, I'm Ron. I'm the, the founding pastor of, of Restoration, and I, I have the honor of serving on our, our teaching team. And right now, if you're just dropping in for the first time, we are in a, uh, a book study of the book of Exodus. And so as a, as a teaching team, we do uh, different topics, and we do books in the Bible. Today, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 32, though, if you want to turn there in your favorite Bible app, or uh, you can do the RST app. How many of you have like paper Bibles? Oh, you're so retro cool. Gosh, that's great. I didn't know people still use those things. That's awesome. Uh, anyway, so we do topics when we feel like God's urging us to speak on a certain topic, but uh, books in the Bible force us to deal with, with topics we would not normally want to deal with, and that, that will be the case today. But we believe that we need the whole Bible to make whole disciples, and that's why we do what we're doing right now. All right, um, good to be back. I've been in, in Southeast Asia for uh, the, the last few weeks, and uh, because of AI and YouTube, and because of a lot of our, our brothers and sisters in Jesus and our disciple-making movements on the other side of the planet are being persecuted, I can't say a whole lot, uh, but I'd love to talk to you on the porch afterwards about it. But I was in Nepal for two days, and while I was there, I thought, hey, what the heck, might as well bag Everest. So um, here's a picture of me. That's a little selfie I took while I was at the top. And um, I'm gonna, I, I, I gotta tell you, it's unseasonably warm this time of year on top of Everest. And the sun is really strong. So it was, it was uh, kind of rough sledding coming down. It was really tough. Also coming off the TRT. I mean, look, I mean, it was really, really harsh. Um, anyway, but uh, in, all, in all seriousness, we, we have this growing disciple-making movement, which is disciples making disciples and planting churches that plant churches. Uh, we have those all, around the, the country right now, but the one, in, the one on the other side of the planet is just, it's explosive. And it's really, really cool to see what God is doing. Uh, just one quick story. Here's a woman that's a part of our, our movement. I mentioned her story a few weeks ago in a message. She was bitten by a, a snake. It was a lethal bite, and uh, her new Christian friends prayed for her, and she experienced a miraculous healing. Um, this woman used to be in, deep into witchcraft, and uh, she now leads a network of 20 to 25 churches. She's begun a new network, and she has personally baptized 60 people. I mean, come on. That's one of these, all right? So as, as uh, Billy mentioned earlier, we're a disciple-making, church-planting church, and we couldn't do what we do locally, nationally, globally. We're not for you and your, your very generous offering. So thank you so much. Huge thanks to Jason Sotis from our lead pastor, wherever he is, for letting me do what I feel most called to do right now, which is make as many disciples worth reproducing as is heavenly possible in my lifetime and uh, working with unreached people groups who've never heard the gospel. Uh, my theme this morning is how, how worshiping the true God helps you become the true you. Thomas Merton once said, to be born again is not to become somebody else, but to become ourselves. Isn't that good? Here's what I know about you. You, you have a holy longing inside of you to become the truest version of you. The, the, the version of you that was meant to bear the image of God and reveal God's glory to a, a watching world. And this, this message will help us move in the direction of fulfilling that, that very holy longing that God has placed in each of us. So we're gonna be in Exodus 32. I'm gonna walk you through the story. I'm gonna paraphrase quite a bit of it, and then we'll be in and out of the text. Uh, if you're new to the scriptures, Exodus is about how the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 400 years and how God rescued them. He delivered them out of Egypt and brought them to the promised land, modern day Israel. Pray for Israel. And then um, on their way going through the desert of Sinai, God created a covenant with Israel. Something like, like marriage vows were exchanged in chapters 19 through 20, if you want to read about those. And we have those those wedding vows. In fact, we call them the Ten Commandments. And the second of the Ten Commandments is in Exodus 20, verses 4 through 5, which says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Okay? So put a pin in that. We'll come back to it a little later. 
And so after God and Israel created this covenant, these, these wedding vows, if you will, God told Moses to go back up to the top of Mount Sinai. He said, hey, you're getting ready to go in the promised land. There's other nations and other gods, and I'm going to give you just some advice and some command, more commands to help you know how to navigate all that stuff. And Moses was there a lot longer than expected, actually about 10 plus chapters long. And the Israelites became bored and impatient, waiting for Moses to come back down the, the mountain. And I don't know about you, but when I get bored and impatient and God's not working on my timetable, um, that historically is when I make my biggest mistakes. Anybody see me? Okay. So uh, that's exactly what happened. They, I, I, I tend to change how I think about God and think about his will, and that's exactly what the Israelites did. And so they decided to do God a favor, and they decided to give God a makeover and create like a designer God, a DIY God. And so they took all the, all the earrings and the jewelry that they had plundered on their way out of Egypt that was meant to be used to create a tabernacle. They took all that and Aaron uh, created a, a golden calf, looked something like this. I took a picture of this in a Marriott hotel a couple weeks ago. Yeah, some of you are like, I think I bought one of those at TJ Maxx. Yeah, so, uh, so they're, they're, these golden calves still are in existence. Uh, calves represent... You know, fertility and strength and um, you know, the unholy trinity of money, sex, and power. So when they finished building the calf, uh, Aaron, uh, who was the priest at that time, said to the Israelites in Exodus 32.4, these are your gods who brought you out of Egypt. So the Israelites, they didn't make a new god, they just sort of refashioned God. And oh, by the way, they went from the monotheism that God was trying to train them to understand about his nature back to their polytheism that they, that they participated in back in Egypt. And as you can imagine, this really, really upset God, really made him mad. And so in Exodus 39, or 32, 9 through 10, it says, I've seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. God's a little mad here, don't you think? So he's really, really upset. We'll talk more about why in a few moments. And then Moses, uh, after God said this to him, came down from Mount Sinai, and when he saw that Israel was like doing Mardi Gras kind of stuff, he got really, really mad along with God, and he took the, the tablets that had the, the wedding vows, the covenant on them, and he threw them down, and they broke in a bunch of pieces, symbolic of the fact that Israel had already broken their covenant with the God who brought them out of Egypt. The marriage was broken, even though they were just on their honeymoon. And the chapter ends this way, in verses 31 through 32, Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed they have made themselves gods of gold. But now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. So here Moses is offering himself as an atoning sacrifice so that God would not destroy Israel uh, for being unfaithful. And um, does that sound like someone else we might know? Okay. So here Moses is being a prototype pointing us to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus that we're going to celebrate a little later when we come to the Lord's Supper. All right, any questions, class? Any, any questions this, this story raised for you? Hopefully a lot. Here's, here's three of mine. First of all, do we do this? Do we do what they did? Maybe we don't create a golden calf, but do we make false images of God? Do we have false ideas of God that we worship more than we worship the true God? And then second question, why did God get so upset? Why all the jealousy? And what's the nature of his jealousy? And then finally, um, what do we do if we discover, perhaps today hopefully, that we worship false gods or erroneous ideas about gods? What do we do with that? Okay. Here we go. First question, do we do this? Do we make false gods? Answer, yes. yes. Uh, we create false gods when we project our desires and false assumptions about God onto God. The, the way to discern if you have false gods or what they may be is to think about what you think about when you think about God. So over the last 40 years, I've caught myself worshiping false images of God. I've passed a lot of people and I've discerned what their false images of God are. Here's just a few just to get you thinking about this. I would just ask right now, by the way, the Holy Spirit is in this place. We are the temple of God. We are the people of God. He promises to be here with us right now. 
And, and at this point in the message, I would ask you to be open to the truth about your understanding of God and ask the Holy Spirit, if I have any false images of God, will you please reveal those to me? Can you guys kind of pray that in your hearts right now? Okay. All right. So here's some examples. Um, one God, and this has been my favorite over the years, success God. Success God exists to help you achieve your financial fitness, relationship, and family goals. If you've never met a hack you didn't like, <laughs> a self-help book you couldn't resist reading or a YouTube video, you might worship, at least unconsciously, success God. And then there's fun God. God just wants to have fun. Kind of like the Madonna song, if you're older. Uh, Not girls, but God. Um, Your church is the mountains and all the other happy places that you like to go to. Uh, Moral police God. If you grew up in a home that was really religious, could have been any religion, but where there was a lot of shame, a lot of rules... You know, uh, God's just sitting there next to the go to hell button ready to slam you, send you off to hell. If that's the kind of home you grew up in, you, you might have that version of God, moral police God. He just wants you to be good. Another God that's like the opposite end of the spectrum from moral police God would be virtue signaling God. Uh, this God tells you that you're innocent of racism, genderism, and all the other isms that are unfashionable today. And here's one that no one thinks they worship, and yet we should be very careful because Jesus says this is the number one false God that people worship, and that's money God. Money God is always the God someone richer than you worships. Have you noticed this? Uh, Jesus even gave it a name. He called it Mammon, a.k.a. money God. And, and then there's ideology God. Uh, this is the God of your, your political party, be it Democrat, Republican, or those other parties that some of you vote for that never win. <laughs> or, or the God of like some ideology that you begin to treat like it's a religion, be it, be it critical race theory or intersectionality or Marxism, queer theory, whatever your theory is, CrossFit for some of you, um, you know, it can become a God. If you're more devoted to it than you are to the living God. Then there's parent God, God's just like your mother or father. This is a big one, by the way. A whole lot of people worship parent God. So if your dad went out for a gallon of milk when you were five years old, never came back, your understanding of God is that God may be this distant, absent parent. You know, like a deistic version of God. He spun everything in place and just walked out for a gallon of milk. Or if you had like a tiger mom and you were always trying to like make tiger mom happy and then you were valedictorian, homecoming king, five-star recruit, and you went on a full ride to Princeton, but she still wasn't happy, then maybe your version of God is tiger God. And then there's quid pro quo God, aka let's make a deal God, aka Santa Claus God. And if you do what God wants you to do, if you worship this God, then he'll do, or he has to do, what, what you want him to do, okay? Whether it be finding a mate, having a kid, uh, getting your health back, whatever. And there's, there's all kinds of gods. John Calvin said that we're like idol-making factories. And if you break the second commandment to have a false image of God, you will certainly eventually break the first commandment not to have other, other gods ahead of the living God. And so there's family God, comfort God, vanity God, house God, sports God. You get the idea. Any version of God that you're more devoted to than the God that Jesus Christ revealed is your false God. So take a look at this list again. Are any of these versions of God a version of God that you worship? And I should have put like other down here. Maybe the Spirit's brought something else to mind. But are you aware of any false gods that you worship? And again, to worship just means you're more devoted to that understanding of God or what you want God to be like than the way God actually is as he's revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Hopefully you're listening. Let's go to the next question. Why does God get so angry about the making of false images of himself? Answer, he's jealous. Exodus 20, verse five. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, God's jealousy is really different than ours. It's like a high school romance kind of insecure jealousy. 
It's, it's a jealousy that's, that's for us. It's, he's jealous for our well-being. And this is where it gets real for me. Uh, when I was 25 years old, lived in an apartment complex, and I'm not sure how apartment complexes are these days, but there used to always be a mail room with a bunch of like brass looking boxes. You put a key in, you pulled your mail out. Is that still true? Gen Zers? Sometimes? Okay. Anyway, so I go in the mail room and I'm, I'm all by myself and I put the key in and I pull out the mail and there's this one letter. Uh, from a man named Dan Allender. And if you're older and you've walked with Jesus a long time, you might have heard of him. He was a famous therapist and author. A few of you, like two of you may know him. And it was from him. And I thought, oh, it's like an advertisement for a conference or something. And I opened it up and I read the first two paragraphs. And I, I, I read them once, I read them twice. And I was trying to figure out what is this? And then I, I realized he was giving advice to my now ex-wife about whether or not she should tell me that she'd already had two affairs in the first two years of our marriage. And the third time I read it, and then it impacted me. And I, I, I've, hey, I'm 61. I've had a lot of pain in life. I've been betrayed. I've lost loved ones. But this was the worst pain I've ever felt in my whole life. The only pain I can, I can think of that could be worse is losing a child. But it was this piercing, searing pain that my wife at that time had betrayed me and had been intimate with other men. And I remember that night, I had a janitorial company. I had to clean accounts. I wept all night long. Um, this, my friends, is how God feels when we worship false gods. This is why this topic is so serious. You can't read Exodus 32 without realizing God is very emotional. In the Western world, we tend to think of God in like, you know, Greco-Roman sort of terms and ideas that God's impassive and all. He, nothing could be further from the truth. In Exodus 32, you realize God is very, very emotional and what we do impacts him. And so I believe when we worship false gods, he feels something like what I felt in the mailroom that day. Well, a few months after I discovered my ex's affairs, I competed in a biathlon, which is a, you run and you ride a bike. And uh, after I finished the race, for whatever reason, she was there and she pointed him out to me. And all I remember five years later, or now, today, about that period of time, was that he was five years younger than me and that he had a man bun. <laughs> I know, I know. You know, and this is before man buns were cool. Not that they've ever been really cool. Unless you're Jason Momoa or something, I guess, you know. But, but I was like, seriously, you traded me for man bun boy? You've got to be kidding me. And, and part of my jealousy really was insecure. I was like sizing him up, like, why him? And what's wrong with me? And, but there's a part of my jealousy, I think, that was like God's jealousy. Because I thought to myself, you know what? I, I care about you. I, I actually love you. He's just using you. And I think that gets the core of God's jealousy. He's jealous for our well-being. I think when he sees us worshiping false gods, he's like, are you serious? Are, are, you, are you kidding me? Really? Like you're trading me, the God of the universe, the God who made you, the God who sent his son to die for you, the God who wants you to have eternal life and be with me forever and ever and ever, the God who desperately wants union with you. You traded me for that for money God, success God, your little Buddha. Seriously? I think it's what, we got, what God must think and feel when he catches us being unfaithful to him. God is jealous for us because he knows he is the one who is best for us. And he knows our false images will always fail us. Jonah 2.8 says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Now, there's a couple ways I've thought of this week that, that, um, that are about how our false images fail us and that arouse God's jealousy. So here's one. False images of God lead us to create false images of ourselves. Worship the true God, you'll find the true you. Worship a false God and you will develop a false self. Okay, we need to lighten this up. 
How many of you have seen, uh, or not seen, read Green Lights or listened to the audio version of Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey? Okay. I feel a little weird recommending it because there's a ton of foul language, but man, it's really good. It's really good. So I listened to it on a trip, the audio version. He's a master storyteller. The opening story, he's got his mom and dad who got divorced and remarried three times. Talk about a high beta, you know, family environment. Uh, they're, they're chasing each other around the kitchen. His mom was chasing his dad, a former University of Kentucky football player, with a knife in the kitchen. And he found like one of those squirt bottles of ketchup and he was squirting her with ketchup as she was chasing him around the island in the middle of the kitchen. I go, this is, this is awesome. And then they end up doing married things on the floor and laughing and Matthew McConaughey and his brothers left the room. The appropriate thing to do. All right, that's just one story, okay? But the whole book is just fun, these really, these great stories. And then in the middle of the, the book, he, he talks about how his career stalled out as, a, as an actor. You could say he had like a failure to launch. <laughs> so he, he was typecast as this rom-com guy. And he realized the reason he was typecast was because he, he'd been presenting a version of himself that wasn't his truest self. And so he did something really gutsy. He just did time out on taking contracts and doing movies, and he just spent a few years uh, engaging what he called his reconnaissance. Okay, and uh, it was during this time he stopped doing drugs and partying and chasing skirts, and he got married, had kids. But it was also during this time he got really serious about pursuing God, and he, he came back after trying different religions and whatnot. He came back to the religion of his youth. And he began to follow Jesus again. And in his memoir, he shares a prayer he prayed during that time. God, when I cross the truth, give me the awareness to receive it, the consciousness to recognize it, the presence to personalize it, the patience, patience to preserve it, and the courage to live it. Good prayer? Yeah. You see, McConaughey couldn't find his true self until he started seeking the truth about the true God. And once that happened, his career took off again. And he started taking on much more mature uh, roles in movies like uh, his uh, Academy Award winning performance in uh, the Dallas Buyers Club. Point being, worshiping the true God is critical for you to find the true you. And God is very jealous because he wants this for you. He wants you to discover the power of living out the image of God that you were designed to reflect. A second reason worshiping false images, I believe, makes God angry is because false images open us up to demonic influence. John 8, says, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. So Satan loves to lie to us and trick us into following cheap, false versions of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 20 says, the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be participants with demons. Paul's coming strong here. He's saying the worship of any God other than the God of the Bible is really the worship of a, of a demon. He's saying behind every false God, there is a demonic power. So I, when I was in uh, Nepal, I, I spent a night at a hotel called the Yak and Yeti. And I'd, I'd been to other hotels in the past, but I was told this sort of famous hotel was where all the Everest climbers would go before they'd climb Everest. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to bag Everest, might as well join him. And so I, I went to this hotel, and I walked in the lobby, and, and immediately I felt this darkness. And engraved in the, in the wood and the statues and little gardens are all these, these gods. Um, there was a snake on top of a serpent, which is a symbol for, for Vishnu, the, the god of preservation. Uh, there were other snakes that were symbolic of Shiva, the god of destruction. Elephant faces all over the place, which were, are symbols of Ganesh, the god of success and prosperity, the remover of obstacles, monkey gods, all kinds of idols and gods everywhere. And then in my room, carved on the walls were other, other idols. And I went to bed that night and I woke up at 10.30. And I, I felt like something was choking me. I started just coughing uncontrollably. And I recognized it as spiritual warfare and so I, I rebuked it and then nothing happened. And then I got mad, which often happens when I'm doing this kind of thing. And I said to this entity, I said, in Jesus' name, the Jesus who's given me 
the power to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. In Jesus' name, get out and don't come back. And immediately it broke and I stopped coughing. Went back to sleep. Next day I was like, I'm out of here. (laughs) Went to another hotel. Had 10 near-death experiences walking 1,600 meters to another hotel, but I was out of there. So why am I sharing this story with you? Because here in the West, we tend to be very naive about spiritual realities. It's really not our fault. We're just not, we're not trained to think this way. We're trained to think, hey, there's a, there's a spiritual reality. We can't see it. We'll, we'll experience it when we die. And there's this material reality. This is where we live. And we, we don't notice the in-between, the over, overlap of those two realities. And this causes us to make some foolish mistakes, to have false images of God, and often to bring like religious tokens into our homes and into our lives. Maybe it's a, a monkey statue from India or a Buddha from Thailand or a third eye necklace or some mala beads from a yoga studio or a dream catcher from New Mexico. But we bring this stuff into our, our homes. And, and we often don't realize those objects have been cursed or at the very least they've been dedicated to false gods. Before Israel went into the, the promised land, God was aware of the fact that there'd be lots of idols and lots of false gods, and they'd be tempted to take this stuff into their, their homes and make it a part of their, their nation. And so Moses preached a sermon and told them to avoid coming even near these false gods and idols. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 through 26, Moses said, the images of their gods you were to burn in the fire. Do not covet the silver and gold on them. They may be cute, that little Buddha with the tummy might really be cute, but do not take it for yourselves or you'll be ensnared by it for it's detestable to the Lord your God. Do not bring a detestable thing into your house or you like it will be set apart for destruction. Regard it as vile and utterly detest it for it is set apart for destruction. Does that seem over the top? Here's what he's saying. You don't have to worship false gods to be negatively influenced by them. All you have to do is be close to them. I wasn't worshiping any idols in that hotel and they were influencing me negatively that night. Intent doesn't matter. So I I share this as one of the pastors on the team here, not to create like a satanic panic today, okay? So parents, please, for the love of God, don't go home and grab your kids' Pokemon cards and set them on fire on the front porch, okay? Don't traumatize your kids with this stuff, all right? Don't go on a, a witch hunt. But at the same time, be aware that you may have things in your home or you may be engaging in certain practices that are invoking the presence of other gods that really are not gods but are demonic in origin. And it will affect you. So I, I do hope that if you own anything that symbolizes another God or another religion, that you'll destroy it. Don't take it to goodwill. <laughs> yeah, throw it away. Uh, in, in recent weeks here at, at Restoration, we've cast demons out of people who've eaten food sacrificed to idols in other countries, who have participated in dance, dances at weddings honoring other gods. Um, we, we've cast demons out of people who've practiced yoga under teachers and gurus who teach Kundalini. Uh, and I'm just naming a few things. We're seeing this happen on a regular basis now in our church and our church plants, and I, I could name many more. So just, just be aware, okay? Be, be open to what's going on in the spiritual realm around us and, and be super careful about ways you may be engaging false gods. Okay. Here's the point. Our, our God is a jealous God He's jealous for our well-being, and and this is why he hates false images and false gods. He hates them because of what they do to us, and not because he's insecure like we are, uh, because he knows false gods will harm us and keep us reflecting from reflecting the true image of God. Capiche? That's Italian for amen, okay? I don't speak in tongues, but I, I, I know capiche, Spaghetti, a few words in Italian. All right. Wow. All right. All right. Last last question. Um, How do we free ourselves from worshiping false images of God? Two steps. One is we need to seek forgiveness for worshiping 
our false gods, and then renounce them. To renounce means to reject, to cut off all ties with these gods. So Moses, after rebuking Israel for worshiping the golden calf, he went back up the mountain, and, and, and this is what he said to God. Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold, but now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you've written. This is, this is huge. Moses is, is offering himself as an atonement for the sins of Israel to appease God's anger and to help God forgive Israel. All sin brings death. Death requires an atonement. And so the Lord replied to Moses in verse 33, whoever sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. God's saying, not gonna happen. Everyone's accountable to me. And so there's a ton going on in this part of the story. So Moses could not atone for the sins of the Israelites because he was just like they were. He was a sinner. And God requires a perfect atonement, a perfect sacrifice. But he was willing to be sacrificed himself, which is huge. But he was a prototype pointing to Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. Romans 3.25 says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand, including the ones the Israelites committed, unpunished. In a few minutes, we're going to come and take the Lord's Supper. And when we do this, I, I want to encourage you to seek forgiveness if you become aware of any false gods that you've worshipped. I want to encourage you, renounce them and seek God's forgiveness and then enter boldly into the presence of God. Your sins have been completely washed away because of the blood of Jesus. Is that good news to somebody? Okay, so receive it today when you come to the table. Second step, we need to turn from our false gods to the true God. We need to seek to have, in other words, a shiny face. Exodus 34, Moses goes back up to Mount Sinai to get a second copy of the covenant that he broke when he came down from Mount Sinai earlier. And it says, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. So in spending time with God, and being in God's revelation of himself in the, in the written word, Moses developed a shiny face. He began to reflect like never before the image of God. The true image of God was in his face. In fact, it was so bright, he had to put a veil over his face to keep people from getting a sunburn. We all need a shiny face. We all long to reflect the glory of the image of God that he designed us to reflect. And the way we get a shiny face is to do what Moses did, to spend time with Jesus and time in his word. It says in Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. As we meditate on Jesus, the, the perfect bearer of God's image, we find the image of God being restored in us and we develop a shiny face. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. The more we meditate on Jesus, the more our face will shine like his face shined. I'm going to end with a story. I've got a friend named Robert. Um, Robert is a, a business guy. He's a real estate developer, lives on the East Coast. And uh, he has one of the largest disciple-making movements in the world. His movement, which began back in 2006, has now reached over 3 million people. 3 million people have been baptized. 60,000 widows have created self-sustaining businesses to provide for themselves and their family. Robert is far from perfect. I've had the chance to get to know him. He can get a little grumpy sometimes. Uh, like all of us, he's got his imperfections and his flaws but Robert reflects well the image of God. He, he spent many, many years with Jesus and he's become a very godly man. And in the morning he gets up and he meditates on the scriptures and he prays and he seeks to obey the scriptures. He does the same thing in the evening. Every morning, every evening. Like Joshua 1, Psalm 1, he reflects on the scriptures. And it's his intimacy with Jesus and his obedience to God that has made him who he is. And I believe it has led to the success he's experienced. 
So you see, my friend Robert has a shiny face. His face radiates the glory of God. So restoration, let me ask you today, do you want a shiny face? Do you want your face to reflect the glory of God? Do you want to become who God has made you to be? The the truest, most glorious version of yourself. Do you want this? Let's not even make that a rhetorical question. Do you want this? Yes. It's your birthright. It's what God has made you for. So here's some actionables for you today. Number one, as we're uh, reflecting and getting ready to come to the table, it says in 1 Corinthians 11 that before we come to the table, to take it in a worthy manner, we need to examine ourselves. So I would urge you to examine yourself again and ask yourself, are you, are you worshiping any erroneous ideas about God, any false images of God? And, and if so, renounce them. Okay. Break them. And ask for forgiveness. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what he needs to reveal to you. And then receive your forgiveness as you come to the table today. Um, as you come to the table, remember what Christ has done for you. He did for you what Moses and the law couldn't do. He was the perfect atoning sacrifice, making your your sins irrelevant in light of eternity. And so come thanking him for his grace and for his forgiveness. And then finally, I want to encourage you as a church to dedicate yourself this week to contemplating the person of Jesus, to making sure you're spending enough time in his presence every day, praying, listening, being in the word of God. His promise to us is that if we'll do that, then we will be transformed from glory to glory as from the Lord, the spirit. We will get a shiny face. Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, as we come to the table today, we thank you for what you did for us. Your body was broken, your blood was shed so that we could receive forgiveness. And one of the reasons we need forgiveness is we we have all fallen short of your glory by worshiping false images and they have done damage to us. They've marred the way we reflect the glory of God to a watching world, a material world and a spiritual world. And so right now we renounce our false images. We ask you to forgive us for them. We come to the table remembering what you did for us. You were the perfect sacrifice that we needed. And we ask this week, Jesus, that as we contemplate you, as we spend time in your word, as we see you more and more clearly, that you would transform us from the inside out and that we, like you, would have faces that shine with the glory of God. We pray this in your name. Amen.